Hello and welcome to another edition of the Ducks Confidential Podcast. I am James Crepia, joined uh, as always by Ryan Clark, and we'll be discussing this week in uh, the final week of the season for uh, the basketball teams, the final week of the season as a whole for the women's basketball team, and the final week of the regular season uh, for the men's team, uh, which plays the Mountain Schools this weekend ahead of the Pac-12 tournament next week, but obviously for the women who just wrapped up uh, their very short stint, uh, which, uh, by judging by the final score and the performance as a whole, one could ask if they were at the Pac-12 tournament at all. Uh, and that is where we will uh, start, Ryan, uh, because no point in belaboring it. Uh, an all-time uh, horrific season. The worst losing streak in program history uh, ends at 14 uh, for the year, which ties for the worst mark by any Pac-12 uh, women's basketball team's in the Pac-12 era, uh, both Cal uh, a couple of years ago in the COVID season and Arizona State last year each also lost 14 in a single season. Uh, and there are programs in the conference uh, as it deteriorates that had worse losing streaks many moons ago. Uh, Washington State, believe it or not, actually had a 45-game losing streak that spanned two seasons. Uh, <laughs> that, that had to really wow. be something. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that really had to be something. Uh, so just think it, it could be worse. Uh, Ducks fans, it could be worse. But uh, alas, 14 straight, uh, and it goes and ends uh, with quite the exclamation point, a 79-30 loss to Colorado. Uh, worst margin of defeat in the series history, biggest uh, margin of defeat in Pac-12 women's basketball tournament history. And uh, I'll be perusing through the record books, uh, but it tops the UConn loss from 2013 in terms of margin of victory uh, or margin of defeat, as it were. So I, I am venturing to guess that if it's not the second largest margin of defeat in program history, because the worst was 65 points back in, I believe it was like 1975 or 76, um, if it's not second to that, then it's third. I mean, you just don't lose by 50 points very often. Uh, it's not even in the notes. Let's put it that way. Uh, so I will be quite literally going through the records uh, to define that. But what a way to end. Uh, what has been an otherwise uh, disappointing season would, would be putting it mildly. Uh, an absolutely horrible season uh, in every way imaginable. And we knew it would be difficult. Knew it would be bad. Knew this team was not going to be terribly competitive. And then five minutes in, it was going to get worse once Peyton Scott went down. But she was not going to cure all these ills. She was not going to suddenly have them win five or ten more games because she was there. Um, that's just not the case. Uh, this team was deficient in every area. Uh, individual players, even the uh, one or two that may have had decent statistical contributions at points, some of that it was bent and skewed in part because of the lack of talent on this team, and which obviously leaves us and sets us up for the conversation that every fan uh, who cares about this program, and there are many, and credit to them, and credit to the people who still showed up, even though attendance went down again uh, relative to even last year, there are still like over 5,000 people showing up to games for this team. So there are people who are still dialed in, who still care, who still want to see this program succeed. And uh, needless to say, they're all uh, furious, upset, uh, emailing me and direct messaging me. That's that's for sure. I've got got a good number of them um, who want change and who cannot pallet this anymore and want to see change happen. And after a performance to end a, a losing streak like that, uh, it's it's hard to make much of a case uh, that it shouldn't happen. We're not here to do it one way or the other. But uh, your thoughts, Ryan, on how this ends and if it is the end of the Kelly Graves era. Yeah. I mean, this, this is definitely uh, a low point for the program over the last few years and, and remarkable given obviously where they were. And we've talked about it before. And Kelly Graves has talked about it before the idea that they were at the mountaintop and then they've suddenly found this, this very low uh, Valley, uh, this, this murky wetland that they find themselves in, uh, in, in this season. And, uh, an uncertain future, frankly. There, there's a lot of fog in that wetland, right? You're, they're looking around and wondering who's going to be in the program next year uh, in terms of players, um, what this staff can do if it is retained in terms of bringing transfers in, bringing recruits in, and retooling the roster in a way that allows them to compete. Um, but that Colorado game was the worst performance of the season and was emblematic, I think, of so many of the deep 
problems that existed with not only the roster but just the performance and and the the style and the the stale sort of approach that that this season had hanging over it um i mean 79 to 30 now colorado very good team a team that could make a nice little run in the ncaa tournament could win the entire pac-12 tournament uh if it gets on on a run here um so so credit to that group for for what i think was a comprehensive performance but that used to be Oregon, right? That used to be a, a team that you feared playing um, that was tough defensively, that had playmakers on offense uh, and had the depth necessary to compete. Uh, Oregon doesn't have any of that. They, particularly on the offensive end, have been dreadful all season, some of the worst numbers in the conference in the country. Um, no shooting, really, to speak of from the outside on a consistent basis. I think Chance Gray led them in three-pointers uh, total this year. And beyond her, I mean, really nobody that was ever making three-pointers with any semblance of regularity uh and and i think a bright spot obviously was filipina shea's um you know development as a as a really solid starting center in the pac-12 and and if if she sticks around she could turn into a, a a very good player but um you just look around the roster i mean they their bench points they were pummeled again by colorado today most games they they had single digit bench points or even like less than five uh the depth that was there for previous oregon teams just isn't there scoring shooting defense where they would sit in in this sort of unmoving zone for games at a time without adjustment and toward the end of the season they started to play a little more man to mix it up that kind of helped in stretches but at the end of the day they don't really have the horses in the stable to win this race right now or to even compete in the pac 12 which is now ending and definitely not compete in the big 10 next year uh with this type of of roster and then this type of approach so yeah people are asking that question is kelly graves going to be retained um he has maintained that you know those type of discussions haven't been happening but who's who's to say at this point whether they have or not we at this point don't know what the future holds for Oregon women's basketball. We can't say definitively one way or the other right now that Kelly Graves will be back. If I had to guess though, given his track record, given the success over the 10 years and, and maybe a longer leash for a coach like him than maybe others, I would say that he, he would be more likely than not to come back next season. The question is, what is the level of urgency on the part of the Oregon athletic department to make what is potentially a hard change that might be unpopular with some fans who've, who've admire Kelly Gray's as a person. I'd love and, to meet him at this point, Ryan. Yeah. But I know, I'm, I'm, like, I'm being serious. Yeah, like yeah. I, I've yet, I, I don't hear, I don't have a, a not a one. Okay. The, the, look, cre again, cre I give credit to this fan base and the credit to the people who do reach out, even those who are just angry at this point, because at least it's not apathy. That's the one thing I can say. People are not apathetic. But I, I, I think if you were retained, the amount of people who are angry and infuriated would become apathetic. Because I, I don't have a single voice coming to me saying, you know, look, just, hey, this was awful, but let's not lose perspective on five and six years ago. No, like, I, I, there is nobody... I am here. For, and again, this is this is fans. I'm, I'm not using a, a crowdsourcing off of Twitter or X as a, the a litmus test uh, by which uh, to assess whether or not to make changes in a program or not. Uh, but I, I have yet I have not heard a voice at all. No, nobody, uh, even those who, yes, who, who have can otherwise appreciate what Kelly did and his staff did uh, with really talented players four and five and six years ago. But I, I am not hearing any voice. Uh, that suggests uh, that uh, that a change shouldn't be made at this point. Um, and obviously, yes, th those who are most upset and aggrieved and or want to be aggrieved uh, scream the loudest, no doubt. But I mean, truly, I mean, we're, we're glossing past because there's nothing to get into in game action. But they shot 18.9 percent from the field today. Yeah, I mean, it's not just that you barely scored. No, you, no one scored in double figures. 
They shot under 20%. I'm also going through the records for that. That hasn't happened in his tenure. The lowest I'm finding so far is back in 2008, a 20% shooting game. And Bev Smith was the coach. We're past the Westhead era. So this is, as I say, everything about it. I mean, look, the best news for the entire program came up within the last week, and that is Caitlin Clark declaring for the draft because just think she could have scored 100 on this team. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to imagine um, imagine this Oregon team uh, against that Iowa team, particularly against Caitlin Clark, who's obviously a legend in the game. Um, you know, it's this game also had an interesting sort of sub storyline that I, I think extends into yes, this conversation. Yes, that's the other kicker that was about yeah. to set up. This is against somebody who is not trying to kill you. Yes. This who, is against someone who's trying to be nice. Yeah, who who has a great deal of respect for you and who is is your, you know, former assistant and somebody who you coached and and frankly, you know, if if that sort of change is made and we don't know whether that's the case yet, but if it is made, would be at Kelly the group, top of the list. Yeah, she'd be at the top of the list. J.R. Payne is is the coach of Colorado. She's done a great job there. Uh, started the season out with an upset of LSU and has has built out a, a tremendous year with a group that seems really bought in and and you know gets it in terms of building out the program now that's not to say that somebody like kelly graves can't re rebound from this but you you look at somebody like that as a potential option if you do make that move and, and i'm wondering too james like i guess others that you know come to mind for you in terms of potential candidates should oregon go that route yeah and and look you call it what it is i i, I hate even um conjecture like this in a lot of ways because at times you could say, look, are you really being fair? And, um, you know, it's, it's two, it's two and three steps ahead of the conversation and what's actually right. happened. But under, under the circumstances, uh, where this has been the only thing the audience has, uh, who's, who's been paying attention to and still died into the program, uh, wants to know and wants to talk about for the last two years. Because for as bad as the season is, the portrayal that, well, this is a super young team and yeah, the injury to Scott hurt and well, there's all these things. No, no, no. This has been a steady decline for four years. We've talked about it in, in passing before, but this is not a one-off. This is not an aberration. This has been set up. This was predictable. Yes, again, maybe it wouldn't have been as extreme had Scott not gotten hurt, but it still would have been really bad. Um, so it, I don't think it is unfair under those circumstances. Uh, and, and again, and Kelly's had a chance to answer for multiple times uh, and address the potential of, uh, of his future and what he thinks about it. So I, under those circumstances, I don't think it's an unfair conversation uh, for us to have or anybody to have because it's the only one that fans are having. Um, yeah, if a change is made, uh, then I, you know who would the quote-unquote potential candidates be? Uh, I would say J.R. Payne would be at or near the top of the list. Uh, I think Cammie Etheridge at Washington State uh, because of the success that she's been able to have there. And also, yes, that Washington State is, is headed to a very, very uh, uh, less prosperous future uh, in the WCC, uh, at least for a couple of years. Uh, so there's that. Uh, obviously, fans um, of the program um, have been clamoring for and demanding Mark Campbell. Uh, who am I to say otherwise? Uh, but bear in mind, he is in just one season at TCU. And uh, I have no idea what his contract is there because as a private school, they don't have to disclose that. So is it entirely possible that uh, any number of um, you know, commitments and the like? And I think that's kind of an important thing to lay as a, a groundwork to the conversation too, Ryan, is, and, that, and we've mentioned it, and I think um, in at least one of our, our previous stories, but if a change is made, uh, and, and the program parts ways with Kelly Graves, you know, this isn't being done for free. There is a business here. And yeah. it does cost one and a half million dollars to do so. Uh, so when you factor in, now you can say, well, if you're already paying them over, you know, nearly 1.1 million, you know, one way or the other, there's a degree of sunk cost. It's a matter of how much further you want to go. Well, how many universities out there, um, at all, are willing to foot a bill for, let's call it what it is. It would be north of three, probably almost four, and maybe more than that, million to part ways with one coach, buy out another coach, and then pay that coach more than you're already paying Kelly and his staff. Um, that's that's a pretty hefty bill. Now, I'm not, it's not a matter of whether right, wrong, do it, don't do it. Again, if we're not here to convince you one way or the other. But these are the circumstances. And while certainly the sport is growing, revenues are growing, uh, there's ticket sale interest, et cetera, et cetera, and the move to the Big Ten and all the other things. Yeah, but in history, 
how many programs have been willing, uh, how many departments have been willing to foot a bill of that magnitude uh, to make a change in a women's basketball coach. And the answer historically is not very many. Uh, so is it possible? I mean, again, this is business. This, there's a cost of doing business if that's the decision that's made, but it would be significant. And in terms of buyouts and other things, again, Graves has 1.5 as to what, what else is out there to then uh, poach somebody else uh, if that is the decision and then pay them accordingly. Uh, you know, there's a lot of pieces there, but I'd start with, like I say, and mentioning uh, potential candidates, J.R. Payne, Cammie Etheridge, uh, Mark Campbell, Lynn Roberts at Utah uh, has also done, obviously, a, a really good job there the last few years. Uh, those would be, if I had to put together a very short list, uh, those would be the candidates on that short list. Those that are, you know, obviously having some great success, um, those who are heading to either really uncertain futures in the case of Washington State or uh comparatively speaking you know less competitive uh in a conference and what does that mean to recruiting at a place at places like colorado and utah uh in the big 12 for women's basketball as incredible as it is in men's basketball it's not you know the pack the shame of the pac-12 uh, uh deteriorating as far as this sport's concerned is that this this was the best con is was the best conference in the country uh in terms of you know overall top end teams uh although we'll, you know, we'll see when the ncaa tournament happens whether or not whether it's South Carolina or LSU or the like, um, that maybe the best team may be elsewhere, but the best collection of teams, it's hard to argue, is not from this league, but now this yeah. league is, is spreading in a lot of different ways. So we'll see. Um, we'll see what, obviously, the next several days have in store, but are there qualified, are there quality coaches out there um, if a change was made? Certainly, uh, including those who have had success in the league that as it stands, uh, those that have had success uh, while affiliated with the program, we'll see again. But yeah, it's, and, I, and is... I think that the contract conversation is an important one to have, too, because, you know, in a sport like this, that obviously is a massive hurdle. And it's something that I, I think makes it significantly less likely for Oregon uh, in this sort of transition time um, to, to not only have to transition transition your program to a new conference, but to have to do so uh, under the circumstances of bringing in a completely new staff. Like that's, that's an unquestionable challenge. And the other piece too, is the idea that, you know, in, in these type of sports, yes, you mentioned it. I, I think that those type of de decisions in general are less likely to be made. Um, I mean, there's a reason why there are so many coaches across women's college basketball that have, have been in programs 25, 30, and sometimes e even close to 40 years uh, is, is, you know, they, they see that stability and they, they see sort of the ups and downs as, as an inevitability. But if you can build a steady, solid upward momentum, um, then, then you're trusted with the keys to the program for a long time. And, and I could absolutely see it going that way for Kelly as well. I think he's somebody that's built a lot of, you know, standing in the community and has shown clearly that he, he cares about, um, Oregon athletics in general and, and, uh, sort of selling that brand to, to recruits and to transfers. Now, whether he can continue to successfully do so is, is obviously a question in the coming years. And, you know, this season is, is, the fruit to bear for, for that not happening. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions up in the air, but I, I do think that somebody like Graves um, is the type of person that is more likely to, to get that longer leash and, and stick around uh, in, in the, in the, at least the short term uh, a year or two into the big 10 era before, like, like obviously if this hap this sort of season happens again next year, it's a much different conversation because, you know, two well, of these types of years in right, a row. Yeah. The same point. Yeah. Look, what fans want to know when you present that Ryan is why should they believe it won't happen? Yeah, at this point, they, I mean, unless there is major change in the off season, uh, they, they, would expect it would happen and it would, might even be worse given the level of competition in the big 10. Right. Right. So, so that's, that's the conversation and that's, uh, you know, that's the unfortunate part about covering college sports and, and being around these sort of programs is you're around, you know, good people that uh, have good intentions and there's a lot of external factors at play, but by, by the same token, um, you know, it's a competitive sport. It's something that, that demands, 
excellence and and you paid money. This is competitive you, sport. You paid to win. Yeah, that's and it. you're paid to win. So yeah, that, this, that, that, that's this is the, the nature of the beast. And and look, part of it also, um, you know, in terms of you know, peace is going forward. And obviously, you know, we'll, we'll see in the days and weeks ahead. Also, regardless of what the, you know the institution chooses to do by way of uh, leadership and Kelly Graves, we'll see what players choose to do. But you know, you get, this is what do you think? You're the only one having the conversation about what a player should do or not, or that it hasn't gone through their mind or not. Now again, we're not going to get in here and get into all kind of speculative conjecture about what these young women will choose to do or not. They'll they'll speak for themselves, maybe. And I say maybe because until today's post game press conference in Las Vegas, um, that our colleague Nick Dashell is at, uh, uh, cover both Oregon and Oregon State while he's there. Um, you know, there hasn't been a player who's spoken in a post game in I think over a month. Um, so maybe they'll speak for themselves. Uh, like I say, I don't, I don't want to go too far and be too presumptuous because we <laughs> haven't heard from anybody. They've been barred from speaking, um, for, for quite a while. So who knows, but their actions, uh, soon will, will be speaking for themselves. Um, but in terms of pieces that could return, I mean, Kelly says today, uh, you know, on, on, on post game radio after the game that he thinks there are, you know, good young pieces. And I'm looking going, unless you're referring to Sophia Bell, who unfortunately also got hurt this year um, and, and was unable to play for nearly half the season. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly who he's referring to by way of from, from a freshman standpoint or something. Um, yes, you know, she, she played she, she played well at times. She did. But in terms of if you wanted to say if everybody came back, and that is a big if. But if everybody came back, who is the quote unquote young piece anymore? Your your core was Van Sluten and Gray, and they're about to be juniors, and Shea is going to be entering her senior year. So the only truly young piece that I, I can identify at this point is Bell. Like I say, Rambus, I, I guess, maybe. But I mean, she averaged three and a half points. I'm not, I'm not saying one way or the other, but like. I suppose I, maybe some of the young pieces uh, are still playing high school basketball. But that's I, <laughs> entirely possible, yeah, if you want to yeah. go that route. But, I mean, obviously, you know, they're, they're not going to suddenly get to – they're not going to go from 11 and, and 20, 11 and 21 to uh, 20 and 11 uh, because a freshman carried them there. Unless that freshman is Juju Watkins. Yeah, um, unless, yeah. unless this, this point guard coming in from Seattle is the second coming of Juju. I, I don't think yeah, that I, that's I don't terribly think that's possible. Happening. So, so, no. So, realistically, I mean, they have to address it in the portal. But they're going to have to address it in the portal no matter who the coaching staff is. Um, it, but just being realistic, this team, if the idea is, well, if you bring back uh, uh, the three leading scores and Sophia Bell is healthy. That's four, and then Peyton Scott's five. And then what changed? <laughs> what changed from what you just tried it out there? Oh, you want to talk about depth in the bench? That's it. That's that was the fix. That's the answer. No, I think you need to create a lot more competition at a lot more spots. Um, so as I, I, I say, obviously, look, it's a horrific way to end. Absolutely terrible. Um, in every way, there's no sugarcoating it. What we got, we're, we're, we're not employed by Pac-12 Network. We're not here to put a, a, a an unbelievable silver lining of positivity on something that was just an absolutely dreadful performance. Yeah, uh, shout out to the game. folks at, at Pac-12 Network, uh, though, for giving us a shout out. Uh, they, uh, on, on one of the recent Oregon women's basketball broadcasts, uh, they, they shouted out my story on there Filipina Shea. So that was nice of them, but I get, I get what you're saying yeah, on, the, like they, on they, the spin zone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, during, during the course of the broadcast, I mean, at times, you know, at least, at least by mid you know, later in the third and throughout the fourth, at least they conceded that the game was over. I mean, I'll give them that, but yeah, yeah. It's not, you know, again, they, look, bottom line, it's been a brutal year. Uh, we've talked about it for several weeks now, and obviously the conversation that many fans were already having and have been having, like I say, for, for t the better part of two years. And, and, and that's not hyperbole. I, like I say, I, I believe me, I have the emails to prove it um, I, <laughs> from some who are very, very, very passionate. Um, they they want to know, not only want to know anymore, they're demanding. And the only thing I can say to fans who want that change who, who, who are around the corner, who cannot be turned back, who will, who will be more angry if, if Kelly and his staff are retained than if a change is made, uh, certainly, or than they are today. That they, they are demanding change, not just talking about it or maybe even wanting it, demanding it. 
then you got to put your money where your mouth is. That goes for anybody in any sport at any program. I don't, I don't care what we're talking about. I would say that of, of pros. Well, you can't necessarily get a, a professional coach fired because of money. Yeah, you can. You don't show up. You don't watch games. You don't buy tickets. You don't watch on television. That's how you speak with, you know, you have the power of the purse strings. If you're demanding change now and not just talking about it, not just emailing writers about it, not just weighing in and saying, oh, they ought to, or all oh, this isn't good, or oh, so and so is doing better, and oh, did you see what this former assistant's doing? If you're truly demanding it and are infuriated, well, then channel that energy and put your money where your mouth is. And I'm not saying that in a challenging way or, or a derogatory way. I'm saying if you're really demanding it, well, Again, the bill is $1.5 million to Kelly Graves and whatever it would be to get somebody else and whatever it would be to pay that person. So unless you're going to contribute to the pot, uh, at this point, letting some steam loose and, and <laughs> I imagine the messages will keep coming to me. Um, but I can't make change happen, nor is it my job to make change happen, nor is it my job not to make change happen. We are here to chronicle what does or doesn't happen along the way. Yes, and but you know who isn't going anywhere? Dana Altman. No, he's not. No, yes. he's not. Though, though there has been much conjecture uh, from national college basketball reporters uh, that, uh, hey, you know, it, it is setting up the coaching carousel conversation uh, for ahead of an offseason as to where, well, obviously changes have already been made, including, unfortunately, for Tony Stubblefield, the former Oregon assistant uh, at DePaul, among other places, uh, Ohio State being another. Uh, so changes have already happened in season. Where else could changes happen? And, uh, for some reason, uh, a couple of national reporters uh, who I can tell you uh, <laughs> haven't covered a game at Oregon, uh, at least during my time out here. Um, and, and one could argue they haven't had much of a reason to do so the last couple of years, but neither here nor there. Uh, wax poetic that, uh, you know, well, there's talk, there's scuttlebutt, there's rumors, there's murmurings that uh, Dana was talking about or considering retiring. And he had a chance to address that yesterday and just said, uh, no, that is uh, not happening. Uh, he's not going anywhere. Now, of course, you know, the jaded and the cynical will say, well, Nick Saban said those things and then he retired. And this person said those things and they retired or whatever. Again, proof will be in the pudding. What do you want us to tell you? The man had an opportunity to address it. And even before opportunity to address it, he was speaking of non-conference schedules for the next two seasons as recently as last week. And setting up games and when to schedule the Oregon State game and MTE events and neutral sites and uh, travel in the Big Ten and how they're going to do that. And not in a bad way, not in a grumpy way, not in a, oh, my gosh, this is a terrible way. No, like just laying out what the framework is. Again, could you do all those things and still change as much? Sure, of course. But for those who... who no Dana Altman and whatnot. For one, I have no reason to disbelieve him when he says it because credit to him, he's a coach who, like, you ask about injuries and he's usually quite forthright. He's usually quite forthright about a lot of things. Yeah, he might even say it before people ask. Like yeah, the other he'll day, just volunteer he, it. Yeah, he was talking about Kuznard being sick during practice. There's a lot of coaches that'd be pretty tight-lipped about stuff like that. Yeah, so. look, he just calls it what it is. So, uh, you know, Dana's a pretty forthright guy. And not to say, like, you know, hey, it's at the end of a season, so it's like, oh, there's rumors about retirement. There are ways to not answer that without outright shooting it down, where you go like, well, he didn't exactly deny it, but he didn't say it. You know, there's ways to parse words. The other part with Dane also is I understand everybody's going to start counting everybody else's age, which I think at times is a little bit of a, a – <laughs> It's an interesting perspective that people, some, some people take at times with that. Um, I, I didn't realize that, uh, that this was a, a job like uh, manual labor, that, uh, that that was such a problem. Um, but okay. But Dane is not somebody who's like looking to go set up on a beach house and do and, and not be around basketball for the next 30 years. He loves the game. He is, he's obsessive about it. Yeah. This is, this is who he is. This is what he does. And he, and he very, one, he's damn good at it in case you forgot. And I realized that, you know, this is, could be a third year in a row bound for the NIT and that's short and that's disappointing and that's not the standard. Yeah, I, I get all those things. But are you suggesting that if he did retire or 
for for a couple of lunatics who actually want, want him fired, which I, I I mean, oh my oh my god, <laughs> like get 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 a little grip of your horses, folks, uh, for for those who, who would be demanding that. But okay, um, you, you're suggesting that Oregon can go out and poach and attain another Hall of Fame coach who's won. 20 games, what will be, what will be, because whether it be this week or in the Pac-12 tournament or sometime in the NIT or elsewhere, a f- another 20 game season, 14 years in a row. You mean there's, there's somebody of that elk out there that they can go out and attract tomorrow? No chance. I mean, come on now. That's not to say that there aren't quality assistants somewhere or that, you know, some coach out there isn't, you know, the new hot thing or that. Kyle Smith at Washington state is an example, isn't having an incredible year and, has been asked about contract in his future because duh, Washington state is <laughs> it's the WCC and they don't have a lot of money anymore. And what's that going to look like? Right. But I mean, come on now. I mean, look to the question, to the issue at hand is he or isn't he retiring? He's had a chance to address it. He shot it down. He said, I'm not retiring. That's for sure. He hasn't talked to uh, anybody by way of the national reporting type. So it's just a lot of, as he called it speculation. And that's all it is. And, and again, I have not heard anything to the contrary. Um, and I, I do keep in contact with some folks who are you know, quite plugged in there, uh, where if there was even a whisper of it, I would like to think I would have heard something to the ilk of. Um, very much like has happened in Tuscaloosa for the last year plus with everything around Saban, where it was a conversation. And yes, he was older. And yes, there was age. And yes, there was NIL and the portal and all the other things. But you don't hear Dana Altman waxing poetic and being critical about that. No, Not he's, a critical he's way. adjusted. He's, he's, he's been one of the more seasoned coaches to just, just you know, slide right into the new suit. He hasn't really been terribly no, bothered by to, it. Yeah, if you want to say, look, they, they ought to get better players or the guys they got weren't as good as or what. Okay, that's, that's a perfectly valid, you know, perspective or, or criticism if you want to take it. Okay, but you can't say like, what, that they didn't attract anybody? or that they were only going to the bargain basement or they weren't recruiting well or they hadn't adjusted. No, they <laughs> recruited well, unfortunately, for Oregon's purposes. Um, you know, one, one of their main three recruits for this year, uh, one of their three freshmen barely played because he was hurt. And he walked in hurt and it, it, you know the season lasted five games for him. And some of the guys that got in the transfer portal got hurt and the like. And that'll be the, again, uh, certainly an, it's been Everybody a season long. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people got hurt. They've <laughs> yeah. lost, they've lost over a hundred games, um, of, of participation by way of the players of, of, you know, several of whom only played five games, uh, Nate Biddle being one, Jesse Zarzuela, Mookie Cook. Well, that that's, that's 24 games and counting. Uh, I believe it is on a per player basis of games missed by, by those three each. Um, and then you add in Bartholomew and his ankle injury and, you know, Shellstad missed a couple of games and Dante missed 12, 13, 14, you know, games. So you start racking it all up and yeah, obviously it's, it's been brutal. But again, for those, if you want to point the, the, again, there's plenty of people who want to get after the training staff and, and the strength staff and some, it, you want to find somebody to blame for all those things. That's a different conversation entirely to Dana Altman, his position. He's the most successful coach in program history. You could, everything's about. That's also true of Kelly, and you could say, "What's you know, what's the difference?" Well, the difference is the trajectories of the programs, the overall performance of the program. That while it may not have been as successful as three and four years ago, there is improvement. They could still win twenty games. They could still finish in the top four of the league. It will take winning the conference tournament for the game to get to the NCAA tournament, but that is still out there impossible. But for all the issues that this team has had this year, mainly around health and the inconsistencies and inability to string together more than back-to-back wins since early January, for all those things, other than Arizona, there is no one in this league who you can unequivocally say, and I realize the league is terrible, it is, but there's no one in this league you can unequivocally say, what, shot past them? No. Yes, Washington State's having a better season, but they did split the season series. So, and we'll see if they meet again in the in the conference tournament. But point being, this team's still fighting, competitive, probably going to win 20 games, if not in the regular season, certainly by the end of the season, for a 14th straight season, could finish in the top four, 
And whether they're bound for the NIT again or not, the issues of a year ago, they couldn't shoot the three. They're shooting better. This is, this team's problems are <laughs> lack of depth because of injury and defense. So new set of problems. But there's other issues. The other issues are things that you can resolve. The other things are, okay, well, you can try and attract, uh, and, you know, retain the best players that you got, build around them. It's going to be hard to do when you lose Kuznard and Dante, who are two best players. You're going to lose them after the season. That's difficult. But they have good players set to come in. They're going to be able to attract good players. Frankly, I think they'll be able to attract better players going into the Big Ten. I think one of the things that's been challenging for Oregon uh, in terms of the transfer portal and those things has been the Pac-12 for the past couple of years. In particular, in this era of NIL and the portal, if you were a premier level, a all-conference or forget about all-American, all-conference caliber basketball player looking to move either within the power what we would call the power six or seven in, in college basketball. Um, if you were looking to move within it or move up to it, and you had teams from, you, you name the conference out there, and teams from the Pac-12, um, chances are you weren't looking at a whole lot of teams in the Pac-12. If it weren't, Arizona, UCLA, or maybe Oregon. And look, they got a few, and some have worked, some haven't. Kuznar was one that did. For all those who want to act like, you know, they never got any good players via the portal. You know, the best player on the team did come via the transfer portal in case everybody forgot. You know, so that that happened. That did occur. Um, and Jesse Zarzuela, who unfortunately got injured after five games, but was off to a decent start at the beginning of the season. Keyshawn Bartholomew, a pretty important piece to this team, came via the transfer portal. Yes, within the conference from Colorado. And I'm not telling you these guys are all American calibers, though Kuznard is awfully good. Um, but they, they've been able to track some. Have others always panned out? No. But I think part of that also is the conference and, hey, am I on television and who am I playing and all the other issues that come with it. Well, now you're going to be playing in the Big Ten. Now you're going to be playing against Michigan and Michigan State and Ohio State and Indiana and Purdue and Iowa and Wisconsin every year. Literally every year. You're playing every one of those teams at least once every single season. And, oh, yeah, you're still playing UCLA twice. And if you very well could play Arizona in non-conference play. So I, I think the ability to attract and retain talent in both basketball programs, but especially in the men's side, is about to become easier, not harder. And I have no reason to disbelieve. And look, we mentioned Tony Stubblefield a, a few minutes ago in the conversation. He could come back. Um, and that's not speculation. That's, I mean, day of the day, on the day unfortunately, that Tony got let go from DePaul. I'd ask Dana because, of course you do, because he'd spent over a decade here and was a great lead assistant. And it's not suddenly like he became a, a, a less knowledgeable coach. Okay, it didn't work at the ball as a head coach. Okay, but can he still be an assistant and come back to the staff? And Dana's outright saying, all right, it's not going to happen lickety-split within a month for the Ranger this season, but I hope he comes back. I hope he gives us a look. Uh, yeah, he very well could. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like this, so there's lots of reasons for optimism about the future and the trajectory of the men's basketball program, particularly with Dana saying he's going to be coming back and he's not going anywhere, particularly with the pieces that they have in line to come back and those set to come in. And yes, and joining the Big Ten. Um, now, it's going to be more competitive. It's going to be harder. Yeah, it's going to be all those things. Um, but I, I think the overall trajectory and what to, to feel about into the future for that program is... It's hard to be particularly critical unless there was a mass set of departures by way of players uh, as soon as the season's over. Uh, I, I don't know how you're you're going into it with a set of gloom or something. I, I, I don't. I, I think there's a lot to build around here no, no, that they I have a chance to work with. I, I think so, too. I, I think that, you know, whether this season ends with them making a nice run in the Pac-12 tournament and getting themselves a, a spot in the NCAAs or not, um, mm. I, I think there is a sort of understanding that, yeah, the, they're going to be on that bigger stage next year. Uh, and and these three years are nothing to sneeze at. Yeah, it's down, you know, from the quote unquote standard of before, but it's it's not. You didn't lose 15 straight games to end the season. <laughs> you you, uh, you just are, are a slightly worse 20-something win team than playing in a bad conference and having a lot of injury issues. There's a lot of layers to to it for them. And, and this week, obviously, they play Colorado and Utah. Um, 
and that'll finish up the regular season schedule. Uh, Oregon obviously would like to get a pair of wins out of that, especially that Colorado game for for seeding's sake in the uh, in the Pac-12 tournament. Um, but but I'm interested to 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 know your thoughts on um, on that Pac-12 tournament. Is it a, is it a win or bust situation for them to get into the NCAA's, or if they win these two, and you you think about net rankings and everything else, but um, if they win these final two and then they make a run, play Arizona and play them tough in that final. Well, a lot has to happen to get to that point. <laughs> but I mean, just just thinking about it, what's uh, are they on the bubble? Then are they back in there? I think if if they win these two, if Oregon wins uh, these two games, which is it would take a lot. Look, they were, they were swept at the Mountain Schools for the first time ever, but they were. Um, so it, it's going to take a lot to win either, let alone both. But if they were to sweep both, which finishes third, uh, so they would get the winner of the uh, um, 6-11, which it, there's much to be sorted out as to who that will be. Um, and then... Presumably, if you win that game, you go on and play the two who would be Washington State. So you're talking about winning four games in a row for the first time since, like I say, early January, spanning back into December. And doing it against two teams who are in the bubble conversation on the outside looking in for most trajectories. Um, then picking up what would be your best win of the season or one of the best wins of the season in, in Washington state on a neutral floor. Uh, is that enough? At this point, I'd still say no because they just don't have enough volume of high quality wins at this point. Basically those would be all the quality wins, those and, and the win over Wazoo at Wazoo. Yeah, in, in January, those would be the only high caliber, high quality wins that the team has. Especially if that championship game went the way of this most recent game over the weekend, right? If they right. if they get blown out, I mean, and then it's just like, okay, Arizona is it? They're the ones that get and to look, show a lot up of teams the Pac twelve yeah. crushed by Arizona too. Sure, I mean, that's but, the other part of it. So, but that, yeah, you think about them compared to the rest of the conference. It's like it 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 becomes clearer in the ideas of. I, in the eyes of the committee, you know? So Yeah, I, I just can't see in the math. I've, I've said for several weeks now, I I just can't. I don't. I realize that these games, these games certainly have meaning. And look, and they need both to assure themselves of third. But, you know, yes, Colorado's first, and you need to win that to stay alive for third. If you lose that game, third's off the table. And then if, conversely, if you lose both, if you're swept the other way, you forget about third, you lose fourth. In all likelihood, yes, this is all under the presumption that Utah beats Oregon State. But in all likelihood, if you lose both, you forget about third, you lose you lose the bye. And fourth would also mean playing Arizona uh, in the second round if you were uh, you know so fortunate to get to the semifinal in the first place. But yeah, uh, you, you really need you really need both of these games to feel particularly comfortable and confident going into the conference tournament, uh, but no less than one, because like I say, with both, assuming that Utah beats Oregon State, then then you're looking at a 5-12. And by the way, the 5-12 is a third matchup with Oregon State, which for whatever reason, as we have talked about before, um, this team has insisted upon making that matchup unbelievably competitive at times when it was unnecessary and doing so for a third time and a final time, a third time this season and a final time in uh, the annals of PAC 12 records uh, to, to boot when obviously it, it has been the case already, but would be the season for Oregon state, not only because it would be the end of the season, by way of if they, if they lose, they go home, but that would make their season. Uh, ending Oregon season uh, in in what would be a five twelve matchup in the Pac twelve tournament, or even if you want to say they're the four and, and Oregon State wins the five twelve and then plays Oregon, whatever, beating Oregon in the Pac twelve tournament would be uh, that that would be the soup. You know, call it what it is. That would be the championship. That would be the Super Bowl. That would be whatever analogy you want. All those things. So, bottom line, uh, this week's important. It's important for seeding. It's important for putting yourself in a position to try to put a run together in Vegas. Uh, but before you can worry about 
how to do that run in Vegas and who it's against and the like, you got to finish uh, against these two teams who Oregon lost to on the road. Uh, yes, it was a minute ago for sure, but they they got to they got to hold court. You know, they they got to hold serve here uh, and win two games that they really need. They need for the seeding purposes because, like I say, without it, uh, you're looking at a five twelve opening round matchup with a team who gave you some fight and it would make it would mean everything in the world to them to to beat you uh, even though Oregon has had you know command in that series for a minute now so we will certainly get into that more next week but we spent this week obviously spending all of our time and much of our time uh on this uh, longer edition of the podcast exclusively on the basketball programs because uh things are wrapping up uh, and obviously with what was uh Disapp extremely disappointing for the women's basketball program and a future that we will obviously be chronicling in the days and weeks ahead. And what will be a uh, pivotal week uh, by way of how this season and how the season and regular season ends, standings, et cetera, et cetera, for the men's basketball program. So we appreciate you for listening as always. Reminder again, if you don't already, like, subscribe, five-star review, all those things. So that way it helps more Ducks fans find us. And you can listen to all the other fine editions of uh, podcasts on the Oregonian Sports Podcast uh, channel uh, to hear from all of our other colleagues and all of the other beats and teams, et cetera, et cetera, uh, across the state. So for Ryan Clark, I am James Creppy. We thank you, and we will hear, uh, we will chat with you next week.